operation here. And um, our, we have like three ways that we create income to do this uh, type of work. The first is the screen we're looking at here is uh, we sell nukes. So if you're not familiar with what a nuke is, it's just a, a mini hive. It's a young hive that um, when we sell them, they're about six to eight weeks old with a, a newly installed queen. That's, uh, that's kind of a picture of, uh, there of me holding a frame of, of bees and brood out of one of our nukes. And then this is a picture. The other side is uh, a nuke sale morning at Central Beekeeper Supply here in Russellville that I sell nukes through. Um, we do that about four weekends in the spring, um, take pre-orders for bees, and then um, I bring them down from the farm to his store there and um, hand them out the morning of. So um, we also sell queen bees. So um, this is a picture of a queen bee in a, in a shipping uh, cage, queen cage. We send them I send a lot of, of queens up north um, to Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan area, because our season starts so much earlier here in the south. Um, I can have a mated queen ready when they're just starting to show signs of spring up there. So it's a pretty good relationship uh, for us to have that outlet to, to send bees north. And then also we sell them here locally through the supply store or just in the mail if someone needs one that uh, can't drive down and pick it up, we, we ship them um, around the, the surrounding states. And then also we produce honey. This is my kids here at a little uh, festival. We sold honey at the, over the summer. Um, we, uh, we do the farmer's market here in Russellville on the weekends and then also do like little festivals and shows and stuff like this. Um, uh, have a lot of fun doing it. So a little bit of fun facts about honey. This is a quart jar of honey, three pounds of honey right here. Um, statistics say that it takes, a that bees have to fly 165,000 miles and visit 6 million flowers to make three pounds of honey. So it's, it's pretty amazing what these little insects can do and how complex they are within their hive. Uh, we kind of take for granted just grabbing a jar of honey and um, what all, there's a lot more that goes on to get to that jar than we know. Honey uh, is the only food made by insects that humans can eat. It's pretty neat. And it is also considered a superfood. It is, I think, the only food that's made in nature that you can sustain life off of if you were to be without everything else. It has all the vitamins, minerals, um, things that you need. It probably wouldn't be a great life, but you could survive if that's all you had was honey. So some reasons bees are important to us. I'm gonna say the number one reason is, is pollination. Bees um, pollinate about 90% of plants and trees need a pollinator to thrive. They don't necessarily have to have it, but they benefit from some sort of insect pollinator. They um, also, through pollination, bees, uh, in one way or another, about a third of our food that we consume, a, a pollinator has had some sort of contact with to create. This is a, uh, I don't know how this is gonna go showing this, but this is a uh, picture of a bee pollinating a flower. And this is this little yellow, uh, thing right here on its leg, that's uh, what they call a pollen basket. So the bees go to these flowers and they collect pollen and they put it in these little basket that they carry on the back of their legs. And you can, I don't know if you can see, but the, the, a bee's kind of got quite a bit of hair on them. So they get down in those flowers and they, uh, they that, that pollen sticks to them. It's not only in the basket, it's all over their legs, head, 
body and then they fly to the next flower and cross pollinate. So that's kind of how that all works. These pictures here, that one in the center, that's a pumpkin blossom. Your melons, berries, vine crops, they really benefit from a pollinator. Um, that's that's the pumpkins that are in our yard right now. We took that picture a few days ago and you can see the basket there on its leg, bright orange from collecting pollen. And then the white plant on the other side there, that's a, that's a pretty good honey uh, maker for us here in the River Valley. It's, it's a privet hedge. Not everybody uh, likes privet hedge, but uh, beekeepers kind of do because they do uh, make some good honey off of it. And then this is red sumac on the other side over there. That's a, a late, later spring, early summer uh, plant that uh, the bees really do like. Makes a little bit of a darker honey. But, um, it, it's really good also. All right, so we're gonna just move right in to kind of the order of a beehive. So there's three different kinds of bees within the hive. You've got your queen bee, your worker bees, and then drone bees. Um, it's pretty neat, the complex social structure within a hive. Every bee has its job. It, the jobs change for some bees throughout their life, but um, it's pretty amazing. I've seen a, a bee hatch out of the, out of the, uh, the cell there and it'll wobble around there on the frame for, for a few minutes and then it, it knows what to go do. It, it's got its instinct, communication, whatever it is, they, they go to work immediately. It's, it's really amazing uh, how they know to do all that. But we'll start with the, uh, the queens. So these are, these are all pictures that I've taken from our bees. Um, obviously you can see the queen in each picture. She's, she's much larger, longer. Um, colored differently. Um, the queen's main job within the hive is to produce eggs. She uh, is kind of the driving force of the hive. Um, pretty well has the, the run of everything that goes on there in one way or another. She's in charge. Uh, a queen during the peak times of year for growth, she can lay between 1,000 and 2,000 eggs a day. So she's really busy. Um, she only mates one time in her life. So when she, uh, she goes out on her virgin mating flight, one time she's mated and that lasts her in her entire life. And she lays, like I said, you know, thousands and thousands of eggs a year. And she will be good for about three years is usually the lifespan of a productive queen. They can live a little bit longer, but they're not necessarily productive uh, after about three years. But you can see that around her are, the, um, are what we call worker bees and they are sterile female bees. They can't lay eggs. So um, they, uh, They make up the majority of the population of a hive. There'll be, I would say they probably make up 98, 99% of the bees that are within a hive. But they, uh, like I was saying, as soon as they hatch out of a cell, they go to work and they work through a whole, whole list of jobs before they even actually leave the hive. They'll start out as kind of a, a maintenance cleaning type job. Then they'll move into a, a, a nurse feeding uh, job for the for the young larva that's growing within the cells, and then they can go into wax building, and then in the end they'll they'll be a forage bee, which means they'll go out and collect pollen and nectar to bring back to the hive to uh, to make honey. The uh, the lifespan of a worker bee during the peak time for them in the spring is about four to six weeks. Their life's pretty short due to the amount of flying. Like I said, they, they fly 165,000 miles to make three pounds of honey. So they're generally their wings wear out is what it is. Um, they fly so much carrying, carrying the nectar and the pollen that they just, their bodies wear out. 
And then in the winter time, they can live up, you know, up to six months because there's not much activity. They're, they're kind of hibernated pretty much through the winter. So they last a little bit longer. And then the, the final bee within the hive is a, a, what they call a drone bee, and that's your male bee. He, uh, he has no stinger, so you don't have to worry about a uh, drone bee stinging you. The, the worker bees, they, they're the ones that if you get stung by a bee, that, that's who stung you was a female worker bee. The males have no stinger, and really their only job is to breed with a, a queen bee. And so um, this is the male bee is the one that's kind of the bulbous bee there in the center. There's a couple of them. Right. Yes. So this one. Yeah. Okay. So um, they're like I said, their only job is is to breed with a queen bee, and if that does, if he's lucky enough for that to take place, he immediately dies after that. So they don't have a very good uh, lifespan or. Um, Life, but they don't do any job within the hive. They get the bees feed them, take care of them. They fly out to do their mating flights, come back. And um, in the winter time, once there's they there's no more need for breeding, they uh, they will be drug out of the front of the hive and and killed. So they don't have to feed them through the winter. Um, when when times get tough, they don't need any extra mouths to feed. So it takes from, from the, this is a little picture of uh, like the growth uh, within the, a cell here. So this is, a, this is an egg, just, it looks just about like a little grain of rice. We're talking super tiny. And then this is the stages it moves through to a full bee. So a queen bee, it takes about 16 days to go from an egg to emerging worker bee it's 21 days and then a, a male bee the drone it's about 24 days so each each one takes a little bit longer to develop all right so now i'm going to move into kind of some uh some beekeeping equipment we're going to start out with the protective protective gear i brought my kids uh bee suit here because it's a little bit smaller and it smells much better than mine does mine kind of smells bad after working in it all the time but this is what i recommend for people especially starting out beekeeping is this is a this is a full jack or a full suit it goes all the way down cuffs into your boots down at the bottom it's tied at the wrist got a little thumb hole here so there's really no way for the bees to get in if you take time to seal at the, the feet and at your hands because I have found that with people that are new, if you can be more comfortable knowing that you're in something that the bees aren't going to get in to, the bees will actually act better to you because they, they sense that nervousness at the hive. And if you're not fully confident in what you're wearing, think they could maybe get in through your pants or something, it's going to show and the bees are going to react to that. Here's also, these are my gloves that I, I just wear all the time, but a big heavy glove that goes all the way up to your elbow. They're vented so they're not too hot. And then um, probably the most important thing as far as keeping the bees calm is this. And I'm sure everybody here knows what this is. This is a smoker. What we do is you'll build a little fire inside of there, smother it out with some leaves or pine needles or whatever you got. And then you give the bees a little just puff of smoke before you enter the hive right in the entrance of it. And this calms them down dramatically. Another tool that beekeepers, this is like their, their hammer for a carpenter is, the hive tool. This is what you use to break everything apart because bees glue everything together, wax everything together. So this is just like a little mini pry bar, keep in your pocket. So now we'll kind of move into a, a basic hive. So this is kind of 
with me having a bunch of bees, we run a little bit different setup than what you would if you just had one or two in your backyard. But this is kind of a, a what you could expect for a, a, a normal setup here. So there's going to be a bottom board on the bottom that holds the boxes and has an entrance. I'm going to try to show this stuff. I didn't know how it would go bringing props, but this is this would be a bottom board. It's just a, a frame that the front's open here, and then the boxes are going to stack on top of this. And uh, yeah, I don't know how y'all can kind of use your imagination with that. They may ask you at the end yeah. to show more when the sure. screen's bigger. Sure. Again, too. So then you got your bottom board, then you've got the boxes. So boxes are, there's different size boxes for kind of personal preference on what you like to have as far as generally it comes down to weight. When you got them full of honey, they can be super heavy. Um, I run, there's eight and 10 frame boxes. I run an eight frame box just because I'm hopefully going to do this for the rest of my life. So if it's something that's not as heavy to pick up, I think it just makes sense to kind of run a little bit smaller box. And then there's uh, deep frame boxes, which are, I'm just going to show you one of these frames. They're just a little bit, they're like a nine and something, five eighths frame. And then, they, then you've got a smaller medium frame, medium sized. And then they even go smaller than that. I, I don't have any of those no. boxes. This is B. The bees did what's in the yeah, middle of that, right? Yep, so, I don't know how if that's coming through. Yep. So I'm going to talk about that that's, next. So this cool. this is what you call a frame. So that's what in that picture that they sit down in the box, and it starts out. I use there's there's a, there's a lot of different preferences, and people do different things with beekeeping. I'm just going to show you what I do. But this is a a frame foundation. It's actually plastic, but it's embossed with the honeycomb pattern on it. And what the bees do is they, they create those, those young bees, worker bees, at that stage in life where they draw wax. And they'll just start to raise wax off of that plastic. And then eventually you'll get something like this. And this is a dark comb. This means she's, the queen has had laid eggs brewed in it but it's, it's kind of hard to see, but it's, it's just solid honeycomb all the way across. And this is, uh, this is what sits in those boxes. And they're either gonna put young bees in them, they store pollen, honey, everything goes through these frames. And so after you've got your boxes, then you've got the cover, it's just a top to keep the rain and stuff out. And, um, like I said, there's a lot of different styles. We, we, I build a lot of my stuff just because we've got a lot of bees. It just makes sense for me to build some stuff, but different things, um, di different, different ways for different people, but there's a lot of different ways of doing the same goal. All right, so I think the best way from here on, I'm just gonna kind of work through the year. Uh, we're gonna start like in the spring what you kind of start out doing and then we'll go in all the way through into winter. Uh, spring here where we live kind of kicks off beekeeping. Bees have been in, in winter not doing a whole lot. They pretty well hibernate. So things are starting to green up. There's some trees starting to bud out and the bees start to bring in some pollen. And um, This is kind of what you want to start looking for. The bees start to, to create brood on the frames and, and a lot of it. That's, that, that's a sign that the bees are starting to grow. Things are, uh, are starting to happen within the hive. They, uh, the amount of brood, several, you're going to have start to see several frames of brood. There's going to be pollen coming in. That's going to that's going to be an outline or a, like a halo around that brood. Multiple colors of, of pollen. There'll be yellow and green and red and all the different kinds of trees are starting to bloom early in the spring. And then uh, just sheer 
bee numbers that the, 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 you pull the cover off and there's bees inside the, the cover all over the frames, kind of like this. They've got honey made on top of that frame there. It's, it's getting full. That's, uh, those are all signs that, that the bees are, are very active and that the beekeeper probably needs to start getting ready for making a split in which we'll go into that in a little bit, but this is what happens when the hives get too full. This, I'm, I'm sure everybody has heard of a bee swarm. This is a uh, swarming is when it's, it's the bees natural way of, of repopulating is what it is. So they, they grow in numbers, they get too tight in, in their area in the boxes. Maybe there's not a third box on top or they, they've just outgrown their space. So naturally what they wanna do is they're going to start another queen within the hive, which I'm not going to really go into that too deep because that's a whole long another lecture about how that all takes place. But they're going to start another queen within the hive and the old queen is going to take about half of the bees and go start another hive, whether it be in a tree uh, somewhere, somewhere else. So that's that's what swarming is. Um, this is, uh, this is what you call a queen cell. So this would be a sign that the bees are getting ready to swarm. So that would be what the, the, the queen will be growing in, the new queen. Um, it looks kind of like a peanut hanging off of the frames. This one's a little bit big. The reason I took the picture, that was the biggest one I'd ever seen. Um, so this is a little exaggerated what you would normally see, but that is a queen cell there. And like I said, once they get that, they, they are getting ready to swarm, that the bees are probably, um, if they haven't already, they're getting ready to, to, half of them are getting ready to leave the hive with the old queen. So for us, this is the point, before they get to this point, this is when we make nukes that I showed you in the very beginning. That's pretty much what a split is for us. We make up the bees to sell off of these um, hives that are before, before they get ready to swarm, when they're at their peak amount of brood and bees in there. So yeah, like I said, so what we're gonna do when we split is we're essentially gonna take we're going to create an artificial swarm. We're going to take about half the bees and brood away from the original hive, put that into a different box, and either you're going to add a queen to it through various methods, or you're going to let them just create their own queen like they would have done in nature if it had been uh, just a regular swarm. Then we're going to move into, so then we're gonna move into uh, honey production. So now the bees have, their, we've, we've eliminated the threat of swarming. We've, we've made our bee splits, got our uh, new hives made up. Now it's time to start thinking about making honey. Um, and like I said, in Arkansas, you've really got between April and July to make, um, to really make honey, they uh, that's what they consider the nectar flow when it's where it runs through there. Um, where I live, the main nectar flow uh, is wildflower, which encompasses a whole lot of different flowers, but um, blackberry, clover, privet, uh, any of you that have lived here any length of time through the spring, you know what, what different things bloom and, and it's everywhere. The uh, fruit trees, the sumac that I showed you earlier, there's a lot of different trees just out in nature and plants um, that, that do create a nectar to make honey off of. So as we're working through the, uh, through the, the hives, that, that frame you see there, it looks white on the front because they uh, Honey has a really, when they bring it in, it, it's, it's almost like water, the nectar is. So they have a process within the hive of drying it. They fan it. And once it gets to a, a, the perfect moisture level, 
they put a wax capping over that whole frame that signifies that this honey's ready, that we can, that it don't have to worry about it anymore. So that's a sign for me when I start seeing capped honey like that, that I either need to add more boxes. So this is, this was a yard this year. As soon as you see one full of honey, either nectar or honey, you stack another box on top. And that's the same process. We'll do that. We'll check every week all the bee yards. We'll go around um, during that time frame there and just continue to stack boxes because bees are really like people as far as uh, you've got ones that just get by, like those ones in the back there that have just got one or two boxes on them. And then you've got overachievers that are going to have five or six boxes and it's a really good rule of thumb for for a bee yard is it, it goes in thirds you've got a third that aren't going to do anything but just get by third that'll do just a little bit maybe a box for you and then you'll have a third that, that really create all your honey um, for the year so um, back to this page so all right nectar flows over we're we're, we're into to end of June, July, this metal board that's uh, behind me on this frame, right? You can see that key mm -hmm. thing. So this right here, these, these are called fume boards. So what we do is we've got an essential oil spray that we will spray on those. And then you, you take the cover off of the hive and then you set that board up there, the fume board, and it's got a shiny metal top <clears throat> and the essential oil sprayed underneath it and the bees do not like that smell. So what it does is it drives the bees out of these honey boxes and pushes them down in the hives so that when we take those boxes off that we're, we're taking very few bees with us back to the honey house. So a good rule of thumb for here. So you don't wanna take all the bees, honey. You wanna take enough that you've got some for yourself but you also need to leave enough for them to live off of in case the summer turns out to be super dry from there on and they don't have enough to, to eat. So a good rule of thumb is to leave about 40 pounds. Then that number, depending on where you live and how your bees do, can, can go up or down. But about 40 pounds of honey needs to be left on the hive to make sure that they have enough to eat after you're done <clears throat> pulling the honey off. So now we're. Uh, Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. 40 pounds per hive, does that mean per box? So, so um, or it would be generally we take our bees once we're done with honey, we get them down into two boxes. And so you would just make sure that that, that's, that top box, the second box on top, had 40 pounds of weight to it so you would just pick it up and if it didn't you would add some of these honey frames to it just to ensure that they've got plenty okay. um, to make it through on thank you yeah so um all right we've got the honey boxes off they're loaded on the truck you can see back there on the back we just put them on uh, pallets and then uh, wrap them with plastic just to keep the, the bees out of them because it gets to a point in the, the summer there where they will they will flat attack you to get into that, those boxes of honey on the back of the truck. So we keep them wrapped up and sealed up tight. Now we're headed back to the honey house to extract some honey. This is a, this is a picture of our uh, honey house where we do all of our processing. Um, honey comes in on one side. Like I was showing you earlier that there, there's that wax capping that signifies that this honey's dry and ready to process. So what you've got to do is you've got to cut that capping off of there. It's just, it's just a little thin um, layer of wax that you're cutting off. We, we do a little bit more than average. So I've got a machine that I'll actually drop that frame in and it's got knives on each side that cut that off. But for somebody that's just had a few, they make what's called a hot knife. And it's literally just a, a, a knife you plug in and it gets hot and it just, that wax just peels right off. Um, so then you've got your, your wax cut off of your frames. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna put it in one of these round contraptions right here, which these are, these are extractors. 
They come in various sizes. These are a little bit bigger. Um, they've got some that are two frame uh, all the way up to, I think they've got 90 frame extractors, mine are 30. Um, so you put your frames of, of, of uncapped honey in there and then it's a centrifuge is what it is. So you either, they have some that you manually spin by hand or you flip the button on and let it, let it uh, electric motor spin it out. But what that does is that slings the honey out on the walls of, of the extractor and then it runs down and you collect it through a valve at the very bottom. Uh, I filter mine just enough to get the big stuff out. We like to leave as much pollen as we can in the uh, in the honey just because it's it's a much healthier jar of honey if you strain uh, less. You don't want to get everything out. I always like to see a little bit of kind of looks like dirt floating in the honey, but it's it's actually those grains of pollen that have uh, that have been uh, spun out with the honey. So this next part is probably the, the, this is the one I always get stuck with when we do beginner's classes. It's not the fun stuff to talk about like we've talked about so far. And this is pest management. So unfortunately, um, beekeeping has changed since about the eighties. Uh, before then, beekeeping was great. You didn't have a whole lot you had to do other than just make sure you had plenty of empty honey boxes to throw on them when they get full. Um, you know, I've heard countless people talk about going out to the back fence row with their granddad and robbing some honey and the bees were just always there. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case anymore. Bees are, uh, they've got a lot of stuff after them. It's not, it's not the same world for them as it was uh, back then. This picture here I'm showing is uh, for me here, there's different things going on in different parts of the country, but for, for right here where I am, uh, this is my biggest problem and this is the varroa mite. So these are um, essentially like a tick for the bee. They get on their back, suck their blood. They actually reproduce inside with the, the, the cells where those young bees were developing, they get down in there and that's where they, uh, that's where they reproduce and then they feed on the developing bees. They carry a, a, a ton of different viruses and disease with them. So they're really like a nasty little creature. They, they, they're uh, invasive, they've come over from overseas, um, I think in the nineties and, uh, it really almost crushed a lot of beekeepers, commercial beekeepers, because nobody had anything. Bees had no natural defense for it. And then the, the farmers didn't know what to do either. They, they had some things that were similar they dealt with, and uh, it really took a toll on the, the beekeeping industry. But there, today, now, there are some different um, treatments unfortunately you have to do. Uh, in my opinion, there are some people that get by with 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 not but uh i've seen the effects of these things and it's not good so we uh we do treat for our varroa mite um twice a year so right after we pull our honey off we do a treatment and then right as we're going into winter which i'll talk about here in a minute uh, late fall early winter we do another treatment but they uh the bees have no natural defense for it they uh they came over from, like I said, from overseas. So it's, it's really a bad deal. I've can maybe a year, the first year they could maybe make it with a, with a varroa mite load on them, but they, they probably won't make it two years. That's really worries me about our wild bees. Uh, I don't really see how they can survive. Uh, I've got bees in boxes that stay dry and I take care of them and I still have trouble with this. I can only imagine uh, a wild feral hive in a tree that's just uh, having to deal with these little creatures. So the next one is uh, the hive beetle. This is not necessarily, definitely not no scale to the varroa mite. They're more of a pest than a threat. They can become a problem, especially in a, in a weak hive that maybe doesn't have enough um, bees to defend keep these be these beetles pulled out they can kind of uh, progress very fast and um, 
can can damage the hive. I've seen where they just run bees off and the beetle kind of took over. But they're uh, they're also from overseas, showed up in the 80s. But um, there's some traps that you can use the, to to catch these things. We use a, it's like a like a thick paper towel almost that the bees bees don't like to have anything foreign within within their hives. So the bees try to like tear these towels apart, and they're they're really fibrous and and they can't tear them, but they fluff them up. And then these beetles try to hide in those towels, and they get their legs hung in them. So that's that's what we use to control beetle. And really a big healthy hive does it on their own. So they're not as bad of a pest, but definitely you're gonna see a couple uh, always, can't ever really get totally rid of them. Um, this is uh, the wax moth. Uh, I hate wax moths. They, they really, they, they don't necessarily attack like a strong hive they're going to get into a hive that's weak or abandoned and they just ruin your equipment is what they do. They make this, they lay these cocoons and it's just, a, it's just really a nasty thing to find if you had a hive that were to die and, uh, or, or abscond, just leave and be abandoned. They get in there and, and within a month they can just ruin you know, hundreds of dollars worth of equipment within that hive. A lot of this stuff is you can't repair it, so it's a loss. This they they lay eggs and then the larva they eat up all the wax on the frames and then they make cocoons that bore into the wood. Just a really bad deal when you get wax moth. But there again, strong healthy hives don't have to worry about this. This next one, uh, this is not necessarily a pest, but this work. I, I don't know if the video, I, are, is anybody else experiencing any lag when he switches slides? Not me. Okay, it, it might work. It, it's a little behind on my phone over here, but I, I give it a try. Let's see. All right. This is not like a, uh, this is really just a fun video that I, I saw that I thought was pretty neat. That, just click it. Yeah. Hopefully. That one work, is it? It's embedded. So this is probably not going to work good, but what this is is that's goldenrod. That's a that's a fall time plant that's actually starting to bloom right now here, uh, where we are. But that is a that's a little crab spider that is that is yellow, just just like that goldenrod, and it, it has caught a bee that was trying to collect pollen or or nectar or something off of it. But it's really camouflaged and it doesn't show up good on y'all's video, but. Uh, those little bees, they've got a lot of stuff out there after them. That was just a little fun video. Uh, so the next thing that we deal with here in Russellville, Polk County, where we live and the surrounding counties, really, um, the black bear population has exploded, um, which is good. I'm not, I'm all about, this used to be the black bear state years and years and years ago, but um, Bears and bees don't get along. So we uh, we have electric fences around all of our yards that are threatened by bears. These were some nukes that I had out um, that I didn't have a fence around quick enough. But the bear, everybody thinks bears are after honey. They're actually after those developing bees, those larva and uh, pupa stage bees and they will destroy the equipment. Uh, it's, it's, it, I hate finding, finding this, it, it costs me money and you lost the loss of the bees, but they'll just take those boxes and go back under a tree and just tear them apart and just take those frames and there'll be claw marks and teeth marks and everything through them. But uh, I try to live, there's nothing you can do about it. So we just live with the bears. The electric fences have hands down worked and I don't set them up like a lot of people say you should. I, I do 
and it works for me. I've actually had um, a, a hive get a bear get into a hive at a yard, put up the fence that day. They come back, they'll get one, and then they'll come back every night until they're gone. Well, they came back, and you could see where the the ground was actually pawed at, where it was getting shocked and wanted to get back in there, but it was the fence was was deterring him. So. Uh, the electric fences definitely do their job as far as keeping the keeping the bears out. All right, so in, in fall, uh, kind of like where we're at now, we're getting close to we uh, we we can on a good year have a nectar flow, a fall nectar flow. Generally, the plants that that flower this this time of year, the honey doesn't <laughs> very good. It, uh, it kind of has a, a strong smell and odor that's, uh, that's not really good. The, the honey tastes good to the bees, but as far as us were trying to collect it, I don't ever do that. I just count it as a blessing as far as them being able to eat that through the winter. So um, if they were running a little bit short on, on honey coming out of summer, that kind of replenishes. So they've got plenty to eat through the winter but that would be the time of year now if, if you didn't have that nectar flow that you might wanna go ahead and start to supplement, feed your bees. Um, we, we, we feed ours when we need to, sugar syrup. Uh, you can do a one-to-one -one mix or a two-to-one mix. Two-to-one is definitely a fall type mix because it's more of the consistency of honey. So they can, they can store it quicker. They don't have to dry as much water out of it as, as they did if it's a one-to-one -to -one mix. And this would be the next time you would wanna to start to look for signs of, of Varroa mite. There's different ways you can test for uh, Varroa mites, but if you've done your treatment, you know, in, in June or July, get into October, it's been a few months, depending on how the bees have fared, it may be time to, to do another treatment. And typically those treatments in the fall, winter, you wanna, you wanna do it when there's uh, the least amount of brood because those, those mites reproduce in the broods. So when the queen starts to slow down for winter, late fall, that's a good time to do those treatments. We have a lot of success because the healthier your bees are going into winter, the better they're gonna look coming into spring. Um, a lot of people have winter loss and it, it can be for a lot of different reasons, but I feel like the effects of Varroa mite, either diseases they had carried into the hive or just the, the fact that they're in there chewing on the young bees, um, you don't have healthy young bees starting out in the spring. You got a bunch of sickly stuff, so they don't they don't fare as well. And then in the winter, again, you're just you're really just checking for supplemental feed. I try to do the majority of that October, November. Um, try to get them full, so then I don't have to really disturb them much once it's once they've really clustered. That, that's what the bees do in the winter. They they just form a ball inside the hive and they vibrate their wings and they keep it, keep it warm in there. I, I don't want to say a temperature, but I think it's like 92 degrees throughout the entire winter by just vibrating. But that they use, use their stores because they'll just slowly be moving through those honey frames and just moving up and down and sideways in there, consuming that stored honey. So uh, y'all know how Arkansas is it can be December and you're wearing shorts so I'll check bees really all year long as far as as weight and they consume it warms up they go out and fly and there's nothing blooming because it's it's middle of winter they come back hungry they consume so on years where it, it it's up and down like it normally is those are the years that a lot of hives will starve because they come back and consume so much so really it's better if you have a year where it just gets cold and stays cold and they just stay hibernated in that state through the through the winter, but we're, we never really have that. So I, I, I keep up with my bees all year uh, in the winter. We're probably every six weeks, we're going to check for, for weight and um, make sure that nothing's happened to them throughout the, uh, throughout the winter. 
it's uh, winter times also when we build equipment, that's your best time to, to get ready for spring. So you're not, when you start to see those those hives growing in size and population, you're not trying to build boxes and put frames together. Everything's just sitting in the building ready to go. Um, it's a good, that's that's the best time to, to have all your equipment ready. Um, and like I said, healthy hives, they 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 make it through the winter. This is a this was a yard there at my house. Uh, all these hives survived. You can see how they're kind of sunken in. The snow's a little bit sunken in there um, on the top. That's that's from the heat of the bees inside there. They're, they've melted that uh, that snow. And I had another video that uh, it wouldn't work when we were putting this together, but it it was. Um, maybe the, the same afternoon or maybe when I took this picture at the same time, but the bees were actually flying at this time right now. The sun had come out and I guess the snow had warmed up enough of the hive that they were actually very active, which was, it was really weird to see snow and, and bees flying around, but that's what I was, go back to what I was saying about them. They, they can kind of burn through their winter stores pretty fast as far as the temperature fluctuating like that. But, um, yeah, that's kind of a year of, of beekeeping here in Arkansas, and um, I'll be happy to answer any question anybody's got. I have no idea how long this took. I'm supposed to talk for an hour, but you did you did about 50 minutes. You did All great. Right, well, I, I mean, go I ahead close. and stop this. Close. Share. Um, okay, so does anybody have any questions? And and I can read them from chat if you don't want to unmute, but you're more than welcome to unmute. Yeah, what type of uh, varroa mite treatment do you use? Yeah, so we uh, we use oxalic acid um, pretty well uh, all the time uh, for our treatments. We'll we'll use the vapor, and we also use it as a as a drench. Um, certain times just depending on what we need but uh, I I do this for a living so I, I don't really push a whole lot of, of oxalic acid on people because you have to be very dedicated on your timing uh, it, it, we go back every five days un, until we have the mites under control so it's it's very labor and time consuming um so I used to I used to really recommend it to newer beekeepers because of it's inexpensive, especially if you're in a club and you can rent, you know, you can use the equipment that the club uh, bee club has. But uh, a lot of people, they would miss a day or two or three and then try to go back and then they'd say, well, I did I did so many treatments and I still had mites. And it was you miss those days, those those mites get back under those cappings and it, it kind of starts over. So. Uh, long story short, yes, I use oxalic acid uh, pretty well uh, all the time for our treatments and had good success with it. So um, Hannah Evans asks in chat, how do you add the supplemental feed to the hives? Okay, so uh, within our hives, we actually have two frames pulled out of our boxes in the bottom. And I have a, it's an in-hive feeder is what it is. And it, it holds a gallon and a half of, of syrup. It's what we call it, sugar syrup, um, that we have a, a big tank that sits on the back of the truck. And I actually have a, just like you'd put gas in your car, we have a, a, a fill nozzle and um, we pump a gallon and a half of feed into them uh, if they need it. But all our hives have that feeder in it just for, sake of ease if we don't have to carry a bunch of feeders with us they just that's our setup we've had boxes that's been in storage for a few years um what kind of considerations should we do as far as getting those boxes ready that's been out of production for a while yeah so uh at first you'd want to check for that wax moth damage um there has been uh, i have noticed a few moths yeah okay so, so you'll probably want to take those frames and you're going you're to want to scrape all the all the wax uh moth um 
the 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 web and everything, the cocoons, everything they've made on there. You're going to want to clean that off. Take a hive tool and you'll just scrape all that off. I've even heard of people boiling them, um, putting mm -hmm. them in like a turkey fryer, and you just put your frames in there and it gets the wax in all the the moth stuff off. I've not done that personally, but we just scrape ours down, and then depending on what kind of frame it is, if it's uh, if it's plastic like this. You can you can recoat that with beeswax, but if it's a natural wax foundation, which a lot of a lot of equipment, uh, this is kind of a newer style of of frames. If it's a natural wax, which is a thin sheet of beeswax that's pinned on each side here, maybe it has wire that runs through it. Yes, you, you would just you would just buy new uh, a new foundation. Oh, wow. they, they they sell that, and then you would just put that back in, on your frames. And then the box, as far as the boxes, I would just scrape the, the wax moth off. Hopefully you don't have any wax moth damage, but if you do, just scrape all that off. And then uh, I would put some sort of, of sealant paint, however you want to do it, uh, as far as, as exterior of the box. But you don't have to seal the inside at all, just the exterior. Okay. Mainly just scraping and cleaning up. The bees are pretty good about uh, uh, cleaning stuff up once it gets on the once the hive's in there. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question um, about the wax. Do you ever intentionally harvest it or do you just drain off the honey and then return the, the frames as they are? Uh. Yep. So, so we, we, we do uh, extract the honey out of the frames and then reuse them. That's one of the nice things about uh, kind of the, the equipment nowadays is that you can reuse your frames for years um, because it takes, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a figure of how much, I think it takes eight pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. So the, so having, having this, already drawn out that you can reuse year after year uh it puts you way ahead having drawn comb but as far as that that wax capping that we cut off of our honey frames that that is what we sell for beeswax we we, we strain all the, the the honey out of it and then melt it down and it's kind of a, a process but we'll filter it about three different times to get all the particles and, and junk out of it and then uh, end up with a, a nice block of, of yellow beeswax. Oh, okay, cool. Because, yeah, I'm interested in candle making too, so I wondered about that. Perfect. Yeah, that's, that's how we do it. Okay, thanks. You bet. Thank you. Okay, so um, Lynn, I'm not sure how to say your last name. Lynn M. says, how do you choose loca the location to place boxes? All right, so uh, as far as our bee yards, um, I have found over the years that uh, you really need a good water source. That wasn't something that I really thought about when I first put bees out, but um, especially like a, a moving body of water, like a creek or a river, lake, something like that, the bees tend to do a lot better at. Um, I actually had to move a yard of bees this year, this summer, that I've had for I've had there going on six years, um, but it got really dry in July, and the creek that was beside the bees actually dried up. And the closest place for them to water was in the people's swimming pool, and it did not go over very well. They got to a point where they said they couldn't hardly get in the pool because the bees were just all over the water and they were drowning and they felt bad. So. I had to move the bees off, but yes, I have found that as far as even as far as honey making, the bees that are close to a, a good reliable source of water do better all the way around. Okay, any other questions? Okay, it looks like that'll be the end of our presentation. So um, we really appreciate you sharing all this uh, information and your time with us, Justin. And we really appreciate everybody who has attended. Um, I, I think this has been a, a really great session. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot and I'm sure everybody else did as well. So thank you guys all so much. We'll see you.
Thanks. See you later. Okay. Uh oh. There it is.